Welcome to The Point. I am John Fugelsang, guest hosting once again in spite of overwhelming popular demand and all your angry emails. Now, um, it's April, and there's a reason 420 is the day we celebrate cannabis, although I'm afraid I can't remember why at the moment. The important thing to know is that cannabis hemp has been in this country a lot longer than white people. And back in colonial days, the biggest <laughs> drug problem we had is the same as the biggest drug problem today, alcohol. Back in colonial days, cannabis was used as a painkiller. It was as American as apple pie, and everybody knew if you smoked the flowery top part of the hemp plant, you would want to eat a lot of apple pie. <laughs> Washington grew it at Mount Vernon. Thomas Jefferson grew it. Thomas Jefferson even helped smuggle rare hemp seeds out of China. Ben Franklin made our first colonial printing press using hemp paper. I'm not saying he smoked any. I'm sure lots of sober guys fly kites during thunderstorms. <laughs> but the important thing to remember is for over 200 years in this country, it was completely Legal. In fact, you could pay your taxes in cannabis hemp for over 200 years. I like to tell children this is where we got the term joint return. Um, Lincoln uh, said, and I'm going to read a direct quote from Abraham Lincoln, two of my favorite things are sitting on my front porch, smoking a pipe of sweet hemp and playing my honer harmonica. That's your first Republican president for you right there. <laughs> now, in the early 20th century, of course, William Randolph Hearst, along with DuPont Chemical, uh, had a fierce campaign to demonize cannabis. In fact, the reason we call it marijuana is because Hearst newspapers adopted that term, which was the Mexican slang. They tried to tie it into racist anti-Mexican fears. When the government finally made cannabis illegal in the late 30s, the American Medical Association officially went on the record protesting in D.C. because they knew that cannabis was a solid painkiller. What this means, my friends, is tell everyone you know that legalizing pot is technically the conservative point of view. So we have three great points on the point this week. The first, in honor of Earth Day, a video from former Obama administration green jobs czar Van Jones. Uh, another from Oaksterdam University executive chancellor Dale Sky Jones, no relation, believe me, about <laughs> celebrating 420 by protesting the failed war in America on cannabis. And finally, our final point will be about the surprise performer who made a rather unexpected appearance on stage at last week's Coachella Festival, a guy who, if he was here, would be enjoying cannabis just as much as when he was alive. Uh, I'm really thrilled to welcome today's panel to my immediate right, Alison Hope Weiner, former entertainment lawyer who now works as an entertainment reporter and hosts the media criticism show Media Mayhem on the Lip TV. Uh, of course, Thanks. I don't need to introduce this guy, <laughs> Kevin Eubanks, oh, the fantastic <laughs> musician man. and composer who for over 15 years worked on a show that I don't need to mention it's what nice it was. It's a nice jacket, man. Yeah, you like <laughs> it, man. I know yeah. they wanted the rugged look, the, the women wanted to, you look good, man. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Really, it's not it's not too rugged, right? It's, not too. No, you're I, right in the... I didn't want to cover up this pasty, death-like crypt keeper torso the ladies <laughs> no, like so man. much. So <laughs> glad to hear it. It's it's great to have you here. And having Good, you man. tell me I'm dressing well is is. Uh... Me, I man, believe me, this is my only shirt. <laughs> <laughs> this is it, man. I don't want to hear it. You redeemed is Jay that Leno. My shirt you had you redeemed Jay Leno aesthetically for 15 years, my friend. Uh, you balanced out the karma of that it's whole two show. cards, man. It's all it's just two cards. Man. And uh, finally, Cara Santa Maria, the science correspondent for the Huffington Post as well as a frequent guest host on The Young Turks. <laughs> okay, I'm really excited about this show, and not just because Kevin and I are completely stoned. Uh, I'm <laughs> kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, we are no, not. he's the only one. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, in honor of Earth Day, we do have our first uh, point of video from former Obama administration green job czar, Mr. Van Jones. Take a look. My name is Van Jones. I am the president and co-founder of RebuildTheDream.com. I'm also the author of the book, Rebuild the Dream. My point is this, if the Republicans want to keep attacking EPA and keep attacking environmental protections for our children by talking about how they're all job killers, I say bring it on. Because the EPA has probably saved more American lives in the past three decades than the Department of Defense. You know, when you're keeping mercury and, and poisons and pollutions uh, out of our kids' bodies, Right? You are protecting America. Uh, I want to ask Republicans, uh, you call us job killers, well, your policies, I call them people killers, kid killers. How many American children are you willing to kill per job? That's the question I have for the Republicans that keep attacking EPA. We should defend EPA, we should defend the environmental protections that are a part of our heritage um, as Americans, and anybody who says that they are willing to kill American children, put them in the, in the, in the ground, poison our children, for a job, we need to challenge them and their sanity. Uh, you can find out more about our, our organization, Rebuild the Dream, at rebuildthedream.com. 
All right, now I love that video, and not just because it looks like a really cool Gap ad, but um, <laughs> when you think about it, why are the Republicans so hardcore coming out against the EPA, especially when it was given to us by a Republican president, Richard Nixon? So, uh, Kara, I want to ask you, as a professional scientist, uh, how do you feel about the GOP assault on the EPA and these other government programs that are designed to keep poison out of our bodies? Well, I have to say that it worries me, and I also kind of want to ask, when did keeping the planet healthy become a partisan issue? Well, it's regulation, it's job killing. That's the argument we're hearing now. They're saying that have, forcing the EPA to keep us from, from having our profits as high as possible by limiting the amount of poison in the air and the water is mm -hmm. gonna be horrible for all the jobs we're creating. They leave out the fact all the jobs they're creating are in Asia, but... <laughs> uh, and the fact that the EPA is actually helping to create jobs. I mean, there was a report, did you guys read this report recently, um, that you know talked about all of the jobs that are actually gonna be saved by a lot of the legislation or a lot of the kind of... Um, Did they come from the EPA? <laughs> no, <laughs> they came from Think Progress, actually. Um, you know, and I think what Van is saying is a really good point. I mean, at, at a certain point, we have to be concerned about, you know, inalienable rights. We have to be concerned about the health and safety of our citizens. And what is the point of creating more jobs if we're not going to live to be able to fill those slots? And, uh, you know, I, do you feel like maybe you, maybe I'm wrong, it just seems like this Republican kind of view, this a, the assault against the, AP, uh, the EPA, I'm sorry, is so short-sighted, you know? It's like, what, what, what's going to happen tomorrow, not what's going to happen 50 years from now? I mean, where, where's the money at? Because usually if you follow that trail, you come exactly. to like a clear cut, this is why, and not, I mean, caring about people, caring about children, compared to how much money it is. Mm -hmm. And once you get down to what's more important, people and money, which side are, is it gonna come down to? Because of course, the EPA is great. Of course, we have to protect ourselves. But if people, you know, if people that are in power, if they think, well, it's gonna cost my company this much if we have to, you know, reach these standards. So, let them die. Because that's we're- why, <laughs> That's why you have to buy Republicans. <laughs> Well, I don't know. As, I mean, as a parent, I'm going to have to come out about against caring about children. But I, I, I think that I think that the issue too with the EPA is just that it, I think in times that are as difficult as the times that we're living in right now, that you're looking at a, a government that hasn't done a very good job of spending the money that we do give it. So when you have an organization, it kind of leaves itself open for criticism if they aren't like carefully showing us how the connection between what they're spending and what they're saving. And I think perhaps there's a bit of a disconnect in terms of that organization. It looks like it's, you know, they're not doing a good job of publicizing what it is exactly they do. And with all due respect to Van, who like is incredibly articulate and makes, you know, want, you want to go out there and, 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 you know, strangle anybody who's against him. I, I mean, I think the issue is, is that they still, while he may be articulating a really, a position that's difficult to disagree with, the actual EPA hasn't done a fantastic job of putting that out there. Okay, well, let me give you some stats the EPA gives out, and you can dispute these if you like, but according- to that report? Yeah, the, 97, <laughs> the 1997 EPA report. Okay to Congress, yeah. the first 20 years of the Clean Air Act programs, again, this is under Nixon, Nixon put this in place. Uh, and that may there, be why everyone's against it. Well, <laughs> but there are those who would say that the EPA is conservative by nature. Yeah. Uh, that the first 20 years of Clean Air Act programs led to, in 1990, the prevention of 205,000 premature deaths, 672,000 cases of chronic bronchitis, 21,000 cases of heart disease, 189,000 cardiovascular hospitalizations, 10.4 million lost IQ points in children because we got the lead out of so much paint. You can make the argument that this is not an example of big government, it's an example of good government. It's what we pay taxes to do. To, we as a community get together and decide we're going to keep ourselves safe. Well, I'm not saying that I'm a, a, an opponent of big government because I, I love a lot of government, just like the next guy. But what I'm saying is, is that the way they are articulating what they're doing well, and yeah. how the message that they put out there. I mean, if they're going to go after, say, um, you know, they're saving land and it's our heritage, then they need to say that if you want to visit this particular spot, they're going to be putting oil dr drilling there. They're going to be doing this. You're not going to be able to go there. 
And that's a part of the land that we all visit that has this many vi million visitors a year that you won't be able to go to anymore. They need to like actually connect what they're doing to something that we're going to lose or in a more, you know, in a better way in terms of broadcasting it. Because basically it just sounds like another monolithic government agency that people don't understand. Except when you think about the fact that, you know, whenever I, when I first came to Southern California, all the older folks I met told me, oh, you should have been here in the 70s. The pollution was disgusting. It was horrible. And everyone you talk to, who was of age in the 70s will tell you that after the 19th, and they always make it the 70s is when yeah, it began getting better. I thought those people were gone. Well, they're, <laughs> no, they're all in Venice, and, <laughs> and we'll be having them on for the next segment. But no, I mean, yeah. you, you'll hear so many people tell you how much better the air quality has gotten in Southern California over the past 20 years, 30 years now, and that's that's the EPA, that's Nixon. Yeah, but California understands that, I mean, we kind of lead the country in, in, in understanding the importance of the connection between tourism and clean air and the connection between, you know, I think this goes to the point that you were making, Allison, that um, this is a word of mouth thing. We're hearing this from, from men on the street. We're not hearing it from these institutions. And I think that this saying. is not just an issue with the EPA. It's an issue with the Democratic Party. Well, it <laughs> bad, bad politics? Bad press. No, it's yeah. bad press. Yeah, bad That's all it is. That is bad politics. That is bad politics. It is. And you yeah, know. Yeah. I, I Kevin? Think, I think in, in, a, in a lot of ways, uh, some of the uh, ways that Republicans present their platform is in a shape of better politics. Amen. I'm not, I don't agree with a lot of, you know, what they want to do, but the way they present it- They're organized. Is, is very clear, and they let you know what's happening, and the whole thing, and, and to your point, saying that, well, and, and yours too, we're hearing it word of mouth and all that, then that kind of makes it harder for you to accept it if it's just like straggling points to you and all, and if you don't have a clear way of, of saying, this is what we're doing, and don't you love it? This, we're saving your kids' lives. Ta-da! You know. Well, you know, like I mean, all those commercials where, like, I'm it, when when they say uh, you're in, I'm in my house, and I've gotten rid of all these certain pesticides, and these all used to be used in your backyard, and now yeah. your children are, you know, something. They, it does need. I don't believe in word of mouth on anything. Somebody's got to write it and like sure. make it. And, and I totally agree with you. And I mean, in they fairness, do, the Democrats do a really lousy job in, in doing that. Ex amen. And in, you know, I think the Democrats are really Clark Kent without a phone booth in so yeah. many areas. But in fairness. There are plenty of Republicans who are environmentally conscious and plenty who do support the EPA's work. I want to bring up something that happened 12 years ago when George W. Bush made New Jersey Governor Christy Todd Whitman the head of the EPA when he became president. Because in my neighborhood, downtown Manhattan, it was Christy Todd Whitman who told folks, you're completely safe going to work, doing relief work at the World Trade Center after the attack. And of mm -hmm. course, as the months and years went on, we found out that was entirely not the case. And now, to this day, there are that. so many 9-11 first responders who have died or very, very ill, and I've never heard a prominent Republican criticize the EPA over this. They mm -hmm. criticize the EPA over trying to enforce laws and bring about new laws to keep poisons out of our air and water. That upsets them. An actual example of the EPA failing I gotta be honest, I wanna hear one Republican. No, you haven't even heard Mr. 9-11, Rudy Giuliani, say anything about it either. I mean exactly. I think it's I think that but the That's point still... is is like putting Christy Todd Whitman in charge of the environment was like absurd. I mean she didn't I mean it was an Why appointment. Why is that? Because she was from Jersey? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, that, that's still I, going, I think there's nothing else to say there. That, that's right? still going back to Republican politics. You know, we know this is bad. The first responders, everybody got all you know, everybody's diseases now, nobody's getting any kind of comfort from that. But in a bigger picture, we're Republicans, so we just will be quiet about that, even though we know that this is... Circle this the wagons. Is, but their big Look, view of politics is like, we don't argue out in public. Yeah, and I think she was brought in because she was a moderate, because she, she was wasn't a someone who was yeah. But she wasn't someone who hated the EPA. No, but she certainly wasn't someone who had a really strong record in environmentalism. I remember when she was appointed, everybody <laughs> in California was, was going, a, what the heck? It was a why big joke you, in New York why, as well. Yeah. I mean, just because she like is supported by Howard Stern doesn't mean that you know she's a you know. I, I mean, would, it was like she's she's cool, but that doesn't mean she is no, I mean, someone who cares about the environment. When you consider that the national security advisor at the time of 9/11, who oversaw that in huge mistake, got promoted to Secretary Secretary of State, and Christy Todd Whitman is the only person in the GOP whose reputation suffered after 9-11, mm -hmm. and it's because of this. And it's it's very sad, but I, I want to just give a couple of uh, quick facts before we end this segment. Mm -hmm. In 2010, the Clean Air Act prevented 160,000 adult deaths from particle pollution and 86,000 emergency room visits. Don't you think if it's reducing the amount of money we're spending on health care, it's conservative by definition? to have a strong environmental protection service for our country. 
I don't think conservatives want us to reduce the amount of money we're spending on health care. I'm not talking right. about conservatives. <laughs> I'm talking about the dictionary. Yeah. Isn't it conservative? Well, that, but you can't course, even but the refer lot of to liberal politics are conservative. Uh, right. you, know, and you cannot yeah. refer to any standard definition of conservative these days. Like, I mean, according to conservative, I mean, conservative is is about pro-business interests. Exactly. And that's what, what you know Kevin was saying before. That's what this is all about. Well, it's and that's why I, I think in the focus groups that Frank Luntz has, uh, the EPA costs us jobs sounds a lot better than regulating the poison in air and water marginally hurts our profits. Exactly. I mean, and this, again, going back to what we were talking about, yes, it's true that the Republicans do a much better job of putting out their PR campaign for anything, whether we're talking about death panels, whether we're talking about, you know, more jobs, less, you know, government regulation. But really, fundamentally, it comes down to, I think, liberals, or I should say progressives, having a more nuanced understanding of these issues. And it's much harder to communicate nuance to the public than it is to communicate a very black and white issue, especially a third rail issue, an issue that's going to get people all you know, hot and bothered. And to say, good or bad, yes or no, black or white, it's much easier for people to, Aren't to grasp. Aren't you sick of liberals being so nuanced? <laughs> <laughs> was that what you were laughing about? Well, no, I was thinking and maybe that is good politics today, to just make it this or that. I think it's because effective politics. It, I don't know if it's good politics. Well, though. I mean, if it's, a, if it's good and you're, you, you're trying to get your policy through, if you get into all nuances, not, and then the Republicans say, well, this is good because it's making America great. Mm -hmm. And you don't do anything <laughs> else. And people want it, you know, and you're wearing red, white, and blue when you say it. Then people go like, yeah. No, nuance, and they don't even nuance know what politics, they, you know. by definition, puts you into Al Gore territory. So I think, I mean, really I, I think that we should rename the, the EPA I, the Freedom Bald Eagle Association <laughs> of Our Children and the Bible Future uh, Co. Yeah. And then it'll, it'll be And we fine. need to make it more about keeping America healthy. That's right. Yeah. The world. And again, yeah. you know, and I this mean, is an I example of an right. area where I want to see Barack Obama stand and smack someone around on this issue because they're now saying that the EPA costs us jobs. And I'm sorry, but going after the EPA to fix the economy is like going after <laughs> Iraq when you were attacked by 15 Saudis. And we'll be right back on The Point after this. Welcome back to The Point. Uh, we're celebrating 420 this week and want to remind you that pot has never actually killed anyone and there's no way to measure how many murders it's prevented. Um, which brings <laughs> us to our next video, uh, which comes from Oaksterdam University Executive Chancellor Dale Sky Jones. Hi, my name is Dale Sky Jones, Executive Chancellor of Oaksterdam University. My point is that we can have safer communities and control marijuana away from our children if we simply choose to control, tax, and regulate cannabis. At this point in time, considering the corruption of the drug war, we have search and seizure. It's robbery with a badge, violating our Fourth Amendment protections. We're empowering terrorist enemies, enriching violent drug cartels, and fueling gun violence and crime. We have over 30,000 violent gangs in America right now. Meanwhile, we're ignoring and releasing child predators, human traffickers, and rapists because we simply don't have room and can't keep up. We're denying a proven medicine to sick and dying people under the guise of trying to control it away from children, and yet things that kill people every day, like cigarettes, alcohol, and prescription drugs, are under the control of regulated people. We're selling contaminated drugs on the street. Meanwhile, we're keeping criminals in charge of the distribution and these criminals do not ID our children. When you look outside, you don't see Anheuser-Busch and Budweiser fighting it out on the street corners with submachine guns. They don't take out guns, they take out advertising. We don't have the dangerous illegal grape growers in our national forests because we have a wine industry that's regulated. We have an opportunity to take cannabis and all of the profits that are associated with cannabis away from these violent criminal cartels. We'd like to do a day of action on April 20th. So on a traditional day of partying for cannabis consumers, we ask you to take just a few minutes to protest the current failed policy and contact President Obama. Come to our website, oaksterdamuniversity.com, to find out how. Get a hold of Obama. Tell him how you feel. Thank you so much for your time and attention to this matter.
<laughs> now, you know what? You're, 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 okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, when I was a kid, they said the same propaganda about pot, that pot makes you violent and lazy. Uh, I think making violent people lazy is the only crime prevention plan that actually works. Uh, Kevin Eubanks, we live in a world where... <laughs> <laughs> we live, all right, go all right on, we, bring now, it, bring now acknowledging that we live in a country where Chris Christie is to the left of Barack Obama on this issue. Okay. Do you think that 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 cannabis decriminalization will come anytime soon, or do you think, Kevin, seriously, that we're stuck with this destructive drug war for years to come? Yeah, I think it's here for a long time because I think it, it serves different purposes. For some people, it could be uh, money that can't be traced which could be used for anything in this mm -hmm. country or any other country. I mean, if you want to start something somewhere but you need funding for it, you can get the money off the street and nobody can track. So exactly. that's serving somebody's purpose. If that happens, I'm not saying it does, but if it does happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and as far as keeping it away from kids and all that, good luck. Yeah. It, you just, you know, any more than you can stop kids from drinking beer or anything like that. But it serves a lot of purposes, the, uh, you know, going to prisons, Everybody knows that for every prisoner, there's a certain amount of money that goes along. People get paid. 48,000 a year paid. in California. So there's a lot of people's salaries. So if you stop these people from coming in, then somebody says, well, I'm not getting paid. So, so we're spending all this money to keep a flower illegal that, again, was growing here long before white people ever settled in this country. Right. And, and yet, what if the government could decriminalize it, tax the hell out of it and regulate it. We've already started seeing that here in California. We've started to. However, yeah. in all fairness to my, my, my Democratic friends out there, this is a president who ran saying he would not interfere with the cannabis clinics, and the exact opposite has happened. Of all the pro this, this is... Well, let's just say, there's plenty Obama of Obama hasn't broken a lot clinics. of promises, but this is a issue. hardcore broken promise, and it's meddling with states' rights. This is an issue where conservatives beyond Ron Paul should care about, well, because they have been harassing the clinics here in California, and again, they're for sick people. And it, well, not exactly. Well, come on. Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. I mean, yes, well, exactly. I mean, no. There's plenty of people that are there getting drugs for uh, sleep disorder, mm -hmm. bad neck pain. I mean, come on. Everybody in uh, that in the certain areas has like a prescription for this. It's like the easiest thing in the world to but get. But what are people yeah. who don't like beer supposed <laughs> to do? I, I, I at, guess. Uh, I'm at, guessing. I worked at Children's Hospital for five years in uh, with cancer teens with cancer, and. Um, Marijuana will, for one joint of marijuana, you can wipe out five different pharmaceutical drugs. Everything from depression, um, nausea, nausea insomnia, yeah, yeah, chronic pain. I'm not arguing pain. with that. I understand so, that it can be a, used to help people. I mean, even if it just makes people forget they're sick, that's fine with me. I mean, but what I'm saying it's is that- It's not that strong. <laughs> Depends. It's what, also not that um, simple. I mean, but, but it, I understand that there's a le legitimate medical use for it. I know that, um, and and I actually come from a whole family where there's a lot of doctors in my family, and I know mm -hmm. that it's used for really serious illnesses. And but what I'm saying is that I also live in Hollywood, and there's a ton of those of the you know mm -hmm. places to buy and dispensaries, dispensaries, and it is. So crime ridden and such a problem, well, even before the feds come in. Well, those are regulated again. Those yes. are, I wouldn't call those crime ridden. Those are on the right side of the law, those dispensaries. You may not, not like the folks who go in and out of them. No, no, and who the knows point what, is, who if you talk to, I was talking to a prosecutor today, and, and we were discussing this, and he says that one of the biggest issues for, and this is, it's a Los Angeles, you know, in, in the Los Angeles area, one of the biggest crime problems for them are these dispensaries. That they, people are getting killed around them all the time, and he was just very, clear on the fact that at least at this point in the semi-deregulation, I mean, it hasn't even gotten to the point that we are talking about, like where there, it's it's everywhere. But at this point in the process, it's a problem. Okay, but I, if they were, if it was legal, that crime would go away. I'd also be interested to see what that prosecutor's personal opinion about decriminalization is based on. No, he's against these. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it well, I mean, like look, prosecutor. <laughs> but, yeah. the, the drug war, as we know it, began. Oh, the, the drug war, as we know it, began in San Francisco, that bastion of morality, in the 1870s, because the problem then was that there was a Chinese opium dens. And people didn't like the thought of young white folks going in to smoke opium with the heathen Chinese. White people took opium as well, but they either ate it or drank it, you know, the, the wholesome ways. So, 
<laughs> when they finally began taxing the importable smokable opium, it was the first time we ever used taxes to control behavior and morality rather than raise funds as the founders intended. And then they banned it. And then what happened? The Chinese underworld flourished. Cops and judges got corrupted. Lives were disrupted. America interrupted. And the drug war as we know it began then. What we're seeing with cannabis now is n really no different than what we saw with Al Capone and Prohibition in the 1920s and 30s. You make it illegal, the underground economy flourishes. And I think that um, what, what Ms. Jones was saying in the video is really you want to take the crime element out of it, then put the government in the business of doing it. But you had the government in the business of regulating prescription drugs too, and look and what's alcohol. happening with that. Yeah, but look what's happening with the prescription. What's happening with that? Lots well, let's of talk about that. Well, well, no, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's there is a fair point. Epidemic because of you've got lot because the pharma That's lobbyists, the pharma lobbyists own politicians, and so as a result, any drug gets approved, and then we have the class action lawsuit coming right afterwards. The distinction here, and I think the biggest reason why pharma doesn't like the thought of medical cannabis, besides the fact it would knock all of their evil drugs out of the woodworks, is people can make this in their backyard. And the profit motive for the big corporations goes away. I, I, I know, but I'm still not going to address my point. No, but Which is? It, oh, hang my on. point Sorry. is, is that I was saying, is that there's, it's supposed to be regulated. People are watching it. Doctors are regulated in terms of what prescriptions they can do. They're supposed to be being watched. And now we have an epidemic right, of but, prescription but drug But no use. one's getting it's, shot for Xanax. It, you know, that's there, not there, true. Are, there aren't street. Vicodin gangs out there. There, there, is, there is a street. Vicodin gangs? There's a street crime. Can you hook me from, up? You can buy Vicodin <laughs> on the street. <laughs> how, how, how crazy do you think the marijuana thing would get if it, you know even if you try to regulate it and I agree with you you really you, know you really the, can't regulate it, especially you, you, you can grow it but I just find it uh, interesting because during the uh, after post Vietnam or towards the end of it they used uh, marijuana in a way to get people off the streets from protesting saying oh well we're not yeah. locking you up because of what you're saying we're locking you up because you're high why you say it yeah so it served a purpose then and these same uh, the people that were hippies or this or that and the other whatever you know smoke free love this and that and the other but now I can't believe there's a drug that gets my penis hard but I can't <laughs> smoke marijuana exactly I mean how do those two things and, exist and I'd in make the, same the argument place? that because one is where you can really make a lot of money from which was really divide you know made for you people that had low blood, blood pressure <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, really. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you are the greatest guest wow. we've ever had on this show. You just woke up. I <laughs> I'm sorry. That's where most people say. Please, Kara. I think we're forgetting the point that there is a um, synthetic uh, THC product on the market that's really? actually got the almost the exact same active ingredient. It's uh, tetrahydrocannabinol called Marinol. It's just mm -hmm. in pill form. And for some reason, in pill oh, form, it's not nearly as frightening. Kind of to the point that you were That's making true. earlier, Indeed. John, it's if true. you're going to smoke it, if you're going to eat it, it's, or, you and there know. are many medical cannabis uh, patients who do take Marinol and who don't like to have smoke in their lungs. And sure. so it's right. great that right. that could and be an option for them. there are still some medical cannabis patients who smoke marijuana that is given to them by the federal government. Absolutely mm -hmm. correct. They grow, they, they provide joints to, I believe, less than 10 people every year. But the government does <laughs> do it. Very special. And since you mentioned the government, let's bring up the fact that the current president admits that he smoked cannabis. Mm -hmm. uh, Governor uh, Bill Clinton did, uh, President Clinton did, and uh, uh, Mr. Bush was vague at best about his past drug use. So here's my point. If these guys really think that cannabis is so evil that people who use it deserve to be locked up, if they believed it, wouldn't they turn themselves in? <laughs> if they thought it was a sin, they'd turn themselves in. If they believed Not in their heart. They were really still. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're locking. Out after his presidency <laughs> saying, I think that cannabis should probably be legalized. Oh, thank you, Bill. Yeah, if only you had been in a position to make that well, statement. Well, Jimmy Carter said it before his presidency, and he caught hell for it. It was never going to happen. But again, if these men, all three of them, really believed it was that awful, they'd surrender themselves to the authorities. They don't they really don't. believe it's that awful. No, it's the they system. They just know that it's a third think, rail issue. Seriously, if they were going to surrender themselves, there's a lot of other things they did that should come first. Exactly, sure. but I'm saying hate the game, not the stoner. Yeah. Yeah. But this, I mean, this is a political move. Hands down, it's a it's political move. move. Kevin, is, is, is pot a drug? Yes. See, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. I don't think it's really a drug until Pfizer makes it a white powder and puts it into pill form. Oh, it's not a I mean, it's a plant. drug at this point, except when she pointed out that it's you, you can. <laughs> but it's, it's a drug, yeah. But, I mean, you just can't say 
heroin and marijuana and say, oh, you want to you either want you want to shoot some heroin or you want to smoke a, you know, yeah, well, j to just throw it in one basket really, <clears throat> and that brings is up the that brings the up the political thing again, you're, and that leads to the whole gateway drug argument. Ron Paul famously said in the GOP debate not too long ago, how many of you would start using heroin tomorrow if it was legalized? Nobody. No. But we always hear that <laughs> cannabis is going to lead directly to heroin. Now I have it on authority that every kid that ever tried heroin started with a beer. Okay, beer is the gateway drug. Really? If, if pot's a gateway drug, then beer is the well-lighted walkway that leads is to the gateway. Is this gate. in your notes? Yeah. <laughs> no, but it, I'm, I'm quite serious, because the longer that cannabis is illegal, and we keep and kids keep hearing, but it's not that bad, it's no worse than beer. Well, then doesn't that make it more likely that kids will think that other drugs can't be as bad? If pot's illegal and it's not that bad, why don't I try Coke? Why don't I try you know, heroin? Having it classified as a Schedule One drug, Having it up there in the ranks with, you know, methamphetamine, I think, to your point, may have that effect on a few people. Yeah. It may have people think, well, I, I tried pot and it's just as illegal. I could get the same prison sentence if I was caught with marijuana as I would with crystal meth. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I mean, I mean, hopefully well, these people not. are more intelligent than that, but there may and be a small percentage of the that population that does think that. You know, and this is an issue when you're trying to make things, like, when these things maintain in that criminal category when we do talk about these things as though they're a third rail issue people aren't being educated about it you know and and the lack of education that our children are getting about these drugs basically we're just saying bad don't touch it don't think mm -hmm. about it don't read about it it's bad it'll ruin your life it'll make you get sick whatever the case may be it's you're either in it or you're out of it you fall in it and you're stuck in it instead of again that nuanced argument and the truth of the matter is if a drug has any medical benefits, it should be regulated and it should be legal for the people who are ill and can get better by taking that drug. You know, my mother is an ex-nun in her late 70s and she said to me, if I was ever really sick and it could help me, I want you to go get it for me. And I said, mom, why wait? <laughs> um, I could talk about this with you guys, I could talk about this with you guys all day, but we do have to take a break. We'll be right back with more of The Point. Welcome back. For our final point, we have a very special video from this past week's Coachella Music Festival featuring an unexpected guest and nobody expected to see walk on stage. Take a look. If you're a Fox News viewer tuning in, that was the apocalypse. Um, <laughs> no, actually, they, they, after 16 years of being dead, presumably having lots of time for sit-ups and crunches, uh, Tupac Shakur took the stage with Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre, who I was beginning to think was a hologram at this point. Uh, Allison, I, I look at you and I see a hip-hop fan. Tell me. Um, <laughs> Is this creepy or is I this? I do like hip hop. Well, is this creepy or is this a way to keep the music alive? I, I don't. I mean, I don't think it's creepy. I mean, I think it's. I thought it was actually kind of cool. I don't. I mean, I except for. I mean, it looks amazing. I gotta say. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's. It's not creepy. I think in terms of. I mean, the first thing that came into my head was like, who has who has the rights? Who's making money? I mean, that was like that. I mean, as a as lawyer. As long as it's not Diddy, I don't care. Um, <laughs> I thought, no, I don't think it's creepy. I don't think it looks, I mean, I don't think you get the same sort of feeling that you would get with a live performance. Um, I guess Kevin would probably speak better than that. But my feeling is, is that, no, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, but it kind of shows like that there is sort of a dearth of, is there like a big hole in terms of talent? Did they not have enough acts? You know, oh. but <laughs> I know. Maybe Feist isn't here. Get Tupac. Um, well, well, Kevin, as a, as a musician, I'm, I'm dying to ask you about this because, you know, whether we like it or not, this seems this is out of the box now. And, and Dr. Dre yeah. made this happen. He went to this company a year ago. And we should point out it's not a hologram. It's actually a 2D image that's on, on projected onto curved glass to make it mm -hmm. seem 3D. Uh, do you see this as being uh, the future of live performance, bringing performers well, back? I think it's the future of a lot of things. Um, not just performance, but uh, I think uh, seeing Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, and people will come to see that. They can, mm -hmm. you can relive anything that you want. And I just 
think the technology has to go that way. Yeah. Now you can do that, and I can see a lot of promoters saying, oh, wait a minute, I don't even have to have an act, and everybody's gonna come, <laughs> I don't have to pay anybody. There's a lot places. of comics to get by that way. You know, so but, uh, a, a lot of that, would be, I mean, I would love to see some, you know, John Kennedy speeches, I would mm -hmm. love to see things like that. I, mean, I hadn't even thought about what it could do for history. Yeah, yeah. It could, all of it just comes alive. You can see it in schools, it, the, the whole thing. It can be used as a, a great learning tool. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. the Disneyland exhibit where the presidents would speak. Like yeah. that, yeah, except that's for really, it's like the, the next really stage. Of you it. Know, yeah. And you'll be watching movies pretty soon after, you know, and once it hits the porn industry, forget it. <laughs> Cara, it's could, over. <laughs> could, this, could technology like this be used to make Mitt Romney seem more lifelike? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> technology can only do so much still. Um, you know, I, I think the question about this is, is it still going to be interesting when the novelty of it wears off? I don't know. Well, yeah, I, I don't I agree. think people are going to go see concerts where it's not even the real person. Are you kidding me? People went to see Michael Jackson tour rehearsal footage yeah. and made it the number one movie yeah, in America. Michael Jackson. Well, this but way they this can see, Tupac. you know, a 3D Michael Jackson. Exactly. This around. is Tupac. I mean, I think that, like I said, if it's a novel thing, if it's a, a great in the music industry, and if it's done, you know, one time, it tours the country, and I just, I don't see it being a lasting way that, you know, I'm seeing all of these op-ed pieces online where people are like, will Rihanna ever tour again? And it's like, no, she's not going to be able to just sell the rights to her image and then not have to work anymore. No, but for Chris Brown, a guy who uses uh, auto-tune while lip-syncing, this is ideal, I think. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I know guys but that it's would... sort of like the next technical iteration of, like, Natalie Cole and that. I mean, it just, we keep yeah. going, like, one step it's, further, so it probably yeah. won't stay stagnant into a 2D. Something else is probably going to happen. It needs to be kind of worked in, I'd too. love to see a Jimi Hendrix concert, if they could do it. I'd love to yeah. see... <laughs> You know, I'd love to see Elvis. The I mean, issue, though, is that it's not new. You're just Elvis. watching something that was That's already recorded. Yes, correct. Nickelodeon. I mean, I mean, <laughs> no, <network. laughs> I, mean, uh -huh. I mean, nobody cares about that anymore. I mean, because everything can be sustained through technology. I just think people will, will find all these different uses for it. And... I, I mean, the only issue I, I, won't yeah. pay to see, I won't pay to go to Coachella anyway because it's ungodly expensive. I definitely won't pay... Three hundred dollars to see a pre-recorded show. Okay, well that would just be you then, probably. Well, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I, to, for people to see Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg with Tupac on stage with them, I'm well, living they in were fear that. By the way, nobody well, knew. Yeah, no one happen. knew. No, if yeah. you get legal marijuana and go, <laughs> it comes alive. It just there you go. That's so fabulous. Again, it comes back to it being novel. It was exciting. Nobody knew it was going to happen. Well, sure, but it's would, also, Do you think all those people would buy those tickets knowing that Tupac was headlining there are guys, two years later? Okay, there are people in my family who would pay to see Sinatra live, even if it was 1990s Sinatra talking about broads and lighting the wrong end of a cigarette. Yeah. Okay? Sure. That would when, still sell When it tickets. comes through your town once. I just don't think sure. if this was a lasting thing rotating at Vegas. Right. I mean, maybe it would Kevin, work Kevin, do you think Vegas. this is like... It would work. But, yeah, it probably would work But I, I would say, tell me if you agree with this, Kevin. Isn't I think this is... <laughs> this to me is like a cousin of sampling. This right. is taking the music Absolutely. and keeping it alive in a whole new way. Yeah. I mean, I mean you, people go to concerts and watch people lip sync. They know they're not singing. Mm -hmm. People still go there. Talking and, to you, Madonna. And, and they, yeah, go to those concerts. You know, so. <laughs> no, but you know what the only issue is, and you probably would be concerned about it, just like, who, where, how does the revenue get divided up? I mean, that, like I said, that was my first impression when I looked at show business. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, label. Exactly. They don't know where my royalties this, are from my first impression. Actually, there, there's, there's record label executives on ledges that have just realized they may still have some rights to get make some money. Money again over exactly. This. That is, that is I mean, that's, that, that would I be mean, a big cluster of, of problems for sure. You yeah. know, but that is. I mean, when I saw that, that was my first thought was just uh, you know because there's already been so much litigation over Tupac and who gets what and how. I mm -hmm. mean, and, and 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 who has a piece of what. So, you know, I mean, and I think as long as somebody can tour and make more of those kinds of. But yeah, it's and live performance. It. No, but it's, well, it, they it's could about, make a whole library of it, and and yeah. then you have like people who there are people now lawyers who work in dead celebrities. I mean, that's their yeah. thing, like booking dead celebrity appearances mm -hmm. and stuff. So, you know, what? I mean, no, it's true. <laughs> well, yeah. Actually, dead celebrity. They, they, they have, Forbes has a dead celebrity list every year, and, and Elvis and John Lennon are usually on it, and Michael Jackson, of course, is topping the list now every year. Celebrities people who bring in a lot of income. Them. They book their like their likelihood. <laughs> they like legislate. They mean, they litigate. Yeah. Yeah. You need to. Get one of those lawyers. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, but I'm glad you mentioned that, Allison, because it does it does bring up an, another interesting point that I haven't heard anyone talk about, which is what would the artists have wanted? Because you know, somewhere someone's trying to talk Puffy into having you know having having Biggie Smalls and and Tupac be friends now and tour together, which I'm sure both men would disagree with violently. I'm living in fear that Paul and Ringo are going to see that footage and get some bad ideas right now. Mm -hmm. You know, because I, I I'm pretty sure John Lennon wouldn't dig it. Um, 
I have no way of knowing. And it's one thing All if you, you can know, have the... Whatever happens is Diddy was friends with whoever's touring. Exactly. <laughs> and he'll make some sort of... But, but at what right? point, no matter how much fun it is, and whether it keeps the music alive, whether it saves the record industry, whether people enjoy spending their money to see this, at what point do you have to say, would the dead artist approve of this? I don't think they care. If they're, if they're going to make money off of it. Is that really, that's really No, I'm not saying I don't factor? think the dead artists care. I'm saying I don't think that the labels care. Well, I, I know the labels don't exactly. care. Exactly, and they're the ones putting these shows Okay, does it matter? If they're yeah, but you know what, the, they, the dead artist, if the dead artist cares, he can make arrangements before he dies for the likeness and use well, of now this. Now it's so funny. This is they like a whole really industry about, all of a sudden. They don't even care about live artists. Exactly right. They care less about dead artists. Yeah. They go like, great, yeah. you're dead. We can just do what we want now. Mm -hmm. You know, can we find some more, you know? Well, when... Or it's about time. Really? And when you look at the record industry, and how it's been destroyed by by the online uh, downloading, uh, and that's the reason why artists have to have as many bands and make all their money on the road. Jack White is now a member of 47 different bands, as I speak. No, he's not. Uh, well, <laughs> four if you count himself as a solo artist. Wow. And Jack White tours all the time with all of his different bands, and we're seeing more and more of this, these, these rock supergroups that are forming. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is a symptom, a, a reaction to the fact that you don't make money off records anymore. So I think that this is the clearest sign we've had that, that this will continue and grow. We're only going to see more of this. What we just saw here with Tupac was like the first time you saw a flat screen TV. Mm -hmm. And a year later, they were everywhere. I agree. And isn't, I agree. This, isn't this just going to exacerbate the same issue that you mentioned? You know, the record labels are losing money because they moved into a download culture. This feels like we're moving into a live download culture. Well, it's the same thing of any, any technology when you say, oh, well, we, we're sending jobs here, we're sending jobs there, now we don't have to have people to do it, we have machines to do it. It's just this thing that just keeps moving along with technology. But the But did you think at, the bottom line is with performing is that people want to see that person at the I prime so. of their yep. career I think doing so. what they do best. And it doesn't want to sound anymore. they don't want to no, listen to a record. No, but you'll get that guy later when he's anymore. dead. But you I, can I have the live that's performance. That's true. We do live in we live in an auto tune culture. We I mean most of the headliners. Oh, that's the most depressing sentence I've ever. Heard. And we do, and most of the headliners at Co Coachella, it's electronic music as it is, and not to belittle that. A lot of people enjoy that, but it's a lot of DJs and it's a lot of programmed music. It's not a lot of kind of. What do you, you know, mean? singer songwriter type folky music. Well, so I, I think I you're think right. All of it gets down to the same point. Whether we're talking about the EPA or the benefits you know, of, of marijuana or this and that, is that people just don't give a shit about people anymore. Oh, Whether yeah. it's... Very cynical, sir. You know, I mean, <laughs> no, I know, saying. I know what he's saying. I know what he's saying. We just saying. don't. I yeah. mean, if we did, we wouldn't be thinking about how can we can rip somebody off because of the new technology. We would think about enhancing the whole thing for people that came to see it. Mm -hmm. how, how, what good can we use from this? Can we uh, encourage people to, to, to treat each other better through the hologram instead of like, oh, well, this person can get ripped off, they're dead, and the whole thing is just, we just don't care about each other anymore, so we don't care about whether it helps you or not, we just want to know, is it profitable for me? Except, and, except for the know. fact that the EPA, Cannabis, and seeing Tupac Live could make a lot of people happy. They could. Especially in conjunction. I do want to point out before we go to break that there was a hologram Axel Rose uh, at Coachella, but it was so realistic it refused to go on stage. <laughs> we'll be back right after this. <laughs> We are taping this episode of The Point here in Southern California a few hours after the announcement of the death of Dick Clark. Um, you're going to hear a lot about Dick Clark as a political figure, how he brought black music to thousands of white kids who never would have heard it otherwise, and how in his later years, despite having a stroke, he made himself go on the show he owned, Dick Clark's Rockin' New Year's Eve. While Dick's post-stroke appearances were disturbing to some, if you've ever loved somebody who's had a stroke, you have to admire the way he forced America to look at a segment of the population that is traditionally hidden away. Um, I first met Dick Clark uh, when I first came to LA doing a primetime network show and uh, the producers didn't think I looked happy on the air and they wanted me to go out and promote the show so I was asked to go on Donnie and Marie's daytime show. This is in the late 90s. You might remember Donnie and Marie had a daytime show. It was edgy but not in your face, political without taking sides and a New York flavor without being too urban. Anyway, <laughs> um, I was backstage and I got to meet little Richard. It was a big thrill but I was really excited about meeting Dick Clark. He was the EP of this show and like most Americans, I'd grown up watching him do everything from bandstand to bloopers, you name it. So they had me on, they, they brought me out on stage. I was waiting in the wings, and Donnie said, Please welcome our next guest. And Marie said, Here is John Fugusang, which is my cousin from Taiwan, but I go with it. I sit down, I begin the interview. Suddenly, there's a voice from above saying, Problem with the camera's got to do it again. 
So I say, okay, no problem. I run backstage. Stage manager runs up. Yeah, hey, John, sorry, problem with the cameras. We have to do that intro again. I said, yeah, I heard, no big deal. I'm backstage in the wings waiting to go back on, and this is all true. My hand to God before me appears Dick Clark. And he looked terrific. He was wearing these, what he called Italian singer boots that were actually lifts but didn't look that way. <laughs> Leather jacket, totally cool, fantastic tan. I'm like, Dick. And he says to me, hey, John, sorry, problem with the cameras. We have to do that intro over again. I said, yeah, Dick, I heard. It's no problem. And he leaned in, this TV icon, and whispered to me, a young guy in his 20s, said to me in my ear softly, there was no problem with the cameras. Marie fucked up your name. <laughs> now, I would go on to work for Dick Clark several times. I acted on a drama he produced. I actually hosted Rockin' uh, New Year's Eve one year from Vegas. And um, I could not help but wonder if, as a young child who was habitually picked on by the goons in the Buttafuoco nation of Long Island where I grew up, I, I always thought I would have had more hope for my future if someone had taken me aside as a young boy and said, fear not, little lad. Despair not, we tot, for one day you shall go to Hollywood and you shall meet Dick Clark, and verily on that glorious day, Dick Clark shall speak to you and use the words Marie Osmond and fuck in the same sentence. We'll miss him, he was an innovator, and uh, <laughs> that's just the most cool Dick Clark story I could possibly share with you. I want to thank all of you for watching. I want to thank our contributors, Van Jones, his new book is Rebuilding the Dream, Oaksterdam University Executive Counselor Dale Sky Jones, and the creepy hologram that's not so creepy of Tupac Shakur. And I want to thank this wonderful panel. You guys have made it a pleasure for me. Um, Allison Hope Weiner, where can folks hear more about your work? Um, they can watch it on the lip.tv. Um, it's my Allison Hope Weiner, Media Mayhem a media criticism show. Brilliant. Mr. Eubanks. Uh, see, I'm on tour all summer and a new record in the fall. And just hit me up on Twitter for all the details. Do verified you, Twitter, not the other. Uh, <laughs> the do, you, do you talk one. back if I follow you? Will you, will you do you talk oh, yeah. back to your fans? Yeah, Right absolutely. on. It's a real pleasure to meet you. Thank you me so too. much. And Kara? Um, you can check out my column, Talk Nerdy to Me, on Huffington Post in the science section. I actually did a piece in honor of 420 on medical marijuana, so check that out. Will you write back to me if I... <laughs> I will, yes. Follow me on Twitter, yes. All right. Uh, I'm on tour with Stephanie Miller and Hal Sparks as part of Stephanie Miller's Sexy Liberal Comedy Tour, in which I play the role of tour. And my <laughs> off-Broadway one-man show about my parents and the clergy, Guilt, A Love Story, is playing across the country. You can learn more about that at guiltalovestory.com. It's always a pleasure to be here at The Point, and it's an especially an honor to be with such a great panel. Thank you all. Thank you guys for watching, and Very we will good. see Thanks. you next time. Yeah, let's hear some clapping. <laughs> <laughs>